I am so glad that you have come to hear me, though you do not even know who I am. And I'm curious as to why you came. Maybe you are here because you are curious about deep sea creatures. While I was still at the university, I designed technology, a machine that would go to the depths of the fjords in Norway. And I could scrape up living creatures and bring them to the surface. I discovered a new species of starfish, which I named for the necklace that Freya, the Norse god, wore. It has arms that are several meters long, and it has nine of them. It is a beautiful creature. You see, even in my deep sea studies, Norse mythology and folklore has been part of what I do. Or maybe you're not interested in deep sea creatures. You would rather hear about the forest of Norway. I was Norway's first official forester, and I spent several years walking the entire circumference, doing forest transects, taking measurements of all the trees. I even had the great opportunity to go to Germany to study German forestry. I can tell you the most important thing I learned is we do not want to do what the Germans did. They clear cut all of their ancient forest. We learned from their mistake that if we do selective harvest, that maybe over time we can select a few trees, then the ancient ones will have offspring and the forest will always be there for generations to come, producing timber. And while I traveled, studying the forest of Norway, I often stayed with the peasants and the farmers, and I collected folk tales and fairy tales from them. And I learned something about the culture and the language, but most important, about the stories that they told sitting around the fires at night. It has always been stories. Maybe you are more interested in turf. You know it is good sod management, management of our grasslands that provides us with such rich Nordic wool, Nordic butter and cream. Our dairy cows are happier when the grass grows green and bright. I was Norway's official turf management director, managing turf throughout the country. All of this brought me back to fairy tales and the folk tales of the people. When I was a very small boy, I used to sit at my father's side, listening to his old friends as they entertained, itself, entertained themselves with these ancient stories. While I was still a student, I met Jorgen Mo, and we began a lifelong partnership, collecting stories. Jorgen Mo, he and I come from very different backgrounds. He was more affluent. He had an easier time getting into the university. We also chose very different paths. He followed a life into the Holy Word and became a Lutheran minister, eventually the bishop Whereas I was more curious about the natural world, about the world our Lord hath made us. And so I studied marine biology and, and forestry. But throughout our lives, Jorgen Mo and I collected stories, which I know is the real reason you are here. Eventually, we documented 60 folk tales and fairy tales throughout Norway, and our stories are very well known. Maybe you've heard of the Billy Goat's Gruff. Maybe you've heard East of the Sun and West of the Moon. Our stories have been translated into every language, inspired great art and dance and music, painting and illustrations. Our stories are known the world throughout. And so I do not care whether or not you know me. Have I told you my name? I am Peter Christian Abjornsen, and I'm known as the father of Norwegian fairy tales. That is what I want you to know. But as a folklorist, with a great interest in the natural history, it was obvious to me that the people of Norway lived in ancient forest. They fished from the depths of the fjords, they grazed their goats and their sheep on the mountainsides. It was the world within which they lived that provided the details to make the stories rich. I 
when I was in Germany, had the opportunity to meet my hero. Would you like to meet your heroes? Who are your heroes? If you met them, what would you say to them? What might you ask? As a collector of folk tales, I was not yet born when Wilhelm and Jakob Grimm began to publish their household and kinder folk marching, their folk tales. I met Wilhelm Grimm. He knew of my work. He said that the folk tales of Norway have added much to the culture of the world. For whereas in Germany, the women are always being rescued by men, it is in Norwegian folklore that the women are doing the rescuing. <laughs> And the trolls and the magic beast are different than the stories you will find in Germany. But there was actually another German. He was a prince, Maximilian, who traveled among the American Indians in 1831, 32, and 33. He was one of the first to begin to make the connection between the culture and the environment within which they live. When he lived among the Indians of South America in Brazil, he asked a very profound yet simple question. Are the Indians of North America different from the Indians of South America? Are they a different race of people? Or are we all one people and our culture is influenced by the world within which we live? Clearly, I would agree with Alada and Prince Maximilian published his books in Germany in 1836, just as Jorgen Moe and I began to collect fairy tales. We were not the only ones collecting fairy tales throughout the world, but we were the first to collect them throughout Scandinavia and in Norway. And because Norway had just recently become an independent nation, these stories were important to our cultural identity as they still are. Hopefully you have heard them from your grandmama and her grandmama. The story you probably heard first, the one we are most famous for, and admittedly one of my favorites, the three billy goats gruff. Long ago and far away, on the mountains of Norway, there were three billy goats, and they were all known as gruff. And in the spring, they were set loose to cross a little bridge over a river near a waterfall high into the mountains to graze where the grass is always greener. Now the first little billy goat was indeed the little billy goat and he went to cross the bridge. Clippity-clop, clippity-clop, clippity- Ah, clippity oh, who is that crossing my bridge? said a vile and nasty troll who lived underneath. I am going to eat you, ha <laughs> ha! No, do not eat me, said the little billy goat gruff. I am very small and barely a morsel. If you will wait, my big brother, the middle billy goat gruff, he will be coming soon. <laughs> Please let me pass. And pass he did, clippity-clop, clippity-clop. And just as he said, a few moments later, the middle billy goat gruff, clippity-clop, clippity-clop, he came crossing the bridge. <laughs> Who is that clippity-clopping across my bridge, said the troll. It is I, the middle billy goat gruff. I am going to eat you. <laughs> No, you do not want to eat me, said the middle billy goat gruff. If you wait just a moment, my bigger brother, he is a feast. He will be coming soon. And the troll allowed the middle billy goat gruff to cross. Clippity-clop, clippity-clop. And just as he foretold, a few moments later, the large billy goat gruff, clippity-clop, clippity-clop, clippity-clop. He was so large, the bridge creaked and moaned with his weight. Who is that crossing my bridge? Ha! Ah, said the troll. It is I, the large billy goat gruff. <laughs> now I'm going to eat you. Ah! Come if you like, but I have two spears to poke out both of your eyes. I have stones to crush your bones. And when the troll leapt up upon the bridge, the billy goat gruff, he tore at the wood with his hooves. He raced forward and he speared him, just as he foretold. He hit him so hard, he went fly. 
green thwomp, and he landed so far away, we never heard from him again. As for the three billy goats gruff, they grazed and fattened in the pasture on the mountainside. They grew so fat they could hardly move, and they might still be there yet. The three billy goats gruff. You are familiar with this story, yes? Now, I mentioned that I was in charge of turf management, um, the pastures and grazelands. If, if we use them appropriately and, and we move our sheep and our goats seasonally, then the wildflowers will yet bloom and the mountain will not erode. There's much we can learn from these simple fairy tales. But the forestry, as I cross the country, doing transects of the types of forests that grow in the lowland, the ones that grow on the hillsides, the ones that circle the mountaintops, and those that can withstand the storms on the very peaks, planting the right trees at the right elevation will help to determine the health of the forest. Harvesting timber is something we have long done in Norway, as illustrated in this next story, the ash lad who competed with the troll. Once there was an old farmer whose soil was poor, but luckily the family owned a large extent of forest. Now the father had gained a great deal of debt and he wished to pay off his debt. He had three sons, but his three sons, they were lazy and reluctant to work. One morning, the old farmer said to his eldest son, you go into the forest and fell some trees lop off their branches and stack the logs and maybe we can sell enough logs that we can pay off some of the debt. Well, the oldest son was reluctant, but he did as his father told him. He took an act over his shoulder and he marched up into the foothills of the mountains. But no sooner had he raised the act and thwack hit the tree at its trunk. Then out came a troll. Who are you to cut my trees? This is my forest. If you continue, I shall gobble you up. It seems that trolls are always hungry for human flesh. Well, the eldest son dropped the ax and he fled so fast he was gone before you knew it. The very next day, the second son was tasked with cutting down these trees. The second son took the second axe and he marched across the long field to the foothills at the edge of the forest. No sooner had he raised the axe over his back and thwack, the troll appeared and once more he fled too. The following day, it was the third son, Ashlad. Ashlad, you must go, said the father. The older brothers, they scorned and laughed and mocked him. He is so afraid, like the rabbit, he will race away as well. But Ashlad said, no, father, I will go. Mother, dear, do you have some food I can take, for I shall be there throughout the day and work hard. The mother said, I do not have any cheese, but I do have some sour milk I could curdle. And maybe if you carry it in a leather sack, by the time you break for lunch, it will be something you can eat. So he put the curdled milk, squeezed out most of the way, and to the leather sack, which he tied to his belt. The father said, but you do not have an axe. Ashlad said, I think I can find the axes that my brother left. And he followed in their footsteps. He crossed the long meadow. He went to the foothills at the very edge of the ancient forest. And sure enough, as he stood there, gazing into these ancient trees, he soon found both axes. He lifted one over his back and thwack. Who is that cutting down my trees? <laughs> if you continue, I shall gobble you up. Ashlad, thinking quickly, reached into the leather sack and he pulled out the curdled whey and he formed it into a ball and said, if you try, I shall squeeze your heart like I squeeze this stone, bringing water from a white rock. The troll, who was a bit of a simpleton, was scared of young Ashlad. He said, let me help you cut down these trees. Please do me no harm. 
And the two of them went at it. And Ashlad said, I bet I can cut trees twice as fast, or at least as fast as you can. And the two of them, thwack, 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 thwack. No matter how fast the troll would thwack, Ashlad would be there beside him. And because Ashlad was very careful to time his stroke with the axe that he always got in the last thwack, then... It appeared that Ashlad felled every single tree throughout the day before the day was through. They had lopped off the branches and stacked a great number of logs, surely enough to pay off his father's debt. But the troll, he said, you are so far from home <laughs> and it is growing dark. Why don't you come to my home and spend the night and we can cut more trees tomorrow? <laughs> Ashlad saw the uh, wisdom in this, and he followed the troll higher and higher into the mountains. In a cleft between two hills was a large cave that the troll called home. The troll picked up two iron kettles, either of them large enough for Ashlad to climb into. And he said, take these down the hill to the spring and fill them while I start the fire. <laughs> and we shall boil porridge for supper. Now, Ashlad knew you only needed one pot for porridge. And he could only imagine what the other pot might be filled with. He also knew these iron pots were larger than he could carry. And so, thinking quickly, he said, no, oh, no. It would be easier for me just to move the spring. So it flows into the pots, and it would save us all a lot of trouble. No, it is my only spring, my only source for clean, clear water. Uh, you start the fire, and, uh, and uh, I'll carry the pots. Which is exactly what Ashlad was hoping. The giant troll took both pots and carried them down the hill. Ashlad stoked the fire, and soon it was roaring. When the troll returned and put the pots on the fire, it wasn't long before they both began to bubble and boil. Porridge was poured into the one. And Ashlad said, why don't we have an eating contest? Let's see who can eat more, more swiftly. <laughs> thought the troll. Yes, this will be the way to fatten you up before I roast you for dinner. Of course, he did not think this out loud. But unbeknownst to the troll, while he was gone, Ashlad took the leather sack and put it down inside his shirt. And so whereas it appeared that he was spooning in porridge two hands at a time, most of it went into the leather sack. And in this way, he was able to at least appear to eat faster than the troll. And when the leather sack was full, Ashlad pulled his knife from its sheath and he sliced open his stomach and the porridge came pouring out. The troll looked on. He was horrified. <gasps> Does this not hurt? No, this is how I beat you in the eating contest. And he tossed the troll the knife. Why don't you try it and maybe you can keep up with me? The troll took the knife and he sliced it across his belly. But as you could imagine, the troll had no leather under his shirt. When he sliced open his entrails, all of his guts spilled out his blood as well. And the troll left this world. As for the ash lad, he scoured the cave and found a great amount of gold and silver. He carried all that he could and paid off his father's debt. And the family still lives there grazing those pastures, harvesting timber from that mountainside. And the troll is no longer there to claim it. Ashlad competes with the troll. Now, this word, Ashlad, have you heard it before? Have you heard of Cinderella? Cinders are ashes, what is left in the fire. All of us, at some point in our life, we have a time of ashes. When you are an adolescent or a teenager, a time where you're not sure of yourself. You feel like the whole world looks down upon you, and you must pass some impossible test to earn 
maturity and adulthood. Aschenputtel is actually the German name for Cinderella. Cinderella is French, collected by La Fontaine and Charles Perrault. In Norway, it is Ashlad, not Cinderella. Maybe you could say Cinderfella. <laughs> but instead of being a damsel in distress, Norway's greatest contribution to the world of fairy tales are strong and clever women who find their own ways out of a jam, like this story, another of my favorites, East of the Sun and West of the Moon. There was a farmer, a poor simple man, who had more children than he could feed or care for. Often their dinner was more broth than meat. And one evening, I remember it was a Thursday evening, the children were sitting around the fire, all doing handwork, maybe knitting or crocheting or carving at wood, when they heard a strange knock on the glass window pane of the front door. It knocked three times. And when the father stepped out to see who it might be, he saw there a huge white polar bear. Good evening, said the polar bear. Good evening, said the farmer. I see your youngest daughter is more beautiful than all the rest. If she will agree to marry me, your whole family shall be as rich as you are poor. Well, I cannot promise my daughter's hand in marriage without her permission. And he went back into his home. He turned to his youngest daughter and he explained the polar bear and his offer. The young girl was quite handsome, but wise as well. And she said, I need the week to think upon it. At this moment, I do not wish to be wed, especially someone I do not yet know. Tell him to come back next Thursday. And the father did so, and the polar bear left. The family all through the week pleaded with her, we could be as rich as we are now poor. And you, no doubt, will live in splendor if to have such a mysterious husband. For her family, she decided she might try this. But it was also for the possibility of adventure. Who knows what she might see and where she might go. And so the following Thursday, when the polar bear arrived, she willfully climbed onto the polar bear's back. As the polar bear began to stride off into the forest, are you afraid, he said. No, I have nothing to fear. Then hold on tight to the fur, and we shall travel far and wide. She held on as tight as she could as they headed further and further to the north, through the great forest, crossing many rivers, to the ice-bound mountains. When they arrived at the tallest, grandest mountain, the polar bear wrapped upon the mountain, and the mountainside opened. And inside was a great and grand castle, more glorious than anything she had ever seen. When she was hungry, a feast appeared. But every night, she went to bed alone, but no sooner had she blown out the candle and fallen asleep than she felt her husband climb into bed beside her. And he was no longer a bear, but a man warm and kind. And they would talk through the night. But before first light, before the first candle was lit, he was gone and she never saw him in his human form. And during the day, though the castle was grand and glorious, it was vacant, it was cold, and she was alone. Time swiftly passed, and she said to her husband, 
I miss my family. I want to go home, see my mother, my dear father, my brothers and sisters. Please, he said, this can be arranged. But you must promise me you will never be alone with your mother. She will try to lure you into another room to have a private conversation. And if you go, if this happens, it will not be good for you or for me. And the tragedy that might befall us, we will not survive. Promise me, please, you will not be alone with your mother. Oh, I, I promise, she said. And the very next day, the polar bear arrived. She climbed onto the polar bear's back, and they rode off down off this great, huge, ice-bound mountain, through the ancient forest, crossing many rivers. But when they arrived, it was not the small hovel or hut that she had grown up in. There was a grand, white manor. Her brothers and sisters were playing in the yard, gleeful and gaily dressed. This is the home where your family now lives. I will be back before dark. You've made a promise, the polar bear asked. Please remember what I said. And he wandered away. Her family, they were so happy to see her. Her mother gave her a huge hug, and the whole family gathered around. They asked many questions. They shared a fine feast. The mother said, what is he like? I wish to have a private word with you. And though she asked this kind of question repeatedly, she always found an excuse to stay at the table with her family around her. But when it was time for dishes and the children went out to play, she carried in an armload of dishes into the kitchen and she was alone with her mother. And her mother asked, so what kind of a man is he? What does he look like when he's a man? You told me he's a bear by day and a man at night. Have you seen his face? Is he as handsome as he is kind? She had no answer for her mother. She had never seen his face. The mother was startled by this news and said, you must, you must light a small candle and tell me what he looks like. He could be a troll with a nose six feet long. And she gave her daughter a small stub of candle that she hid in her bodice. And that night, when she knew that her husband was asleep, she pulled out the candle and she lit it. She held it over him. It was the most handsome print you could ever imagine. But as she leaned over, three drops of wax fell onto his shirt. He awoke startled. You spoke to your mother, did you not? And now I must leave you. If we could have waited even a few more weeks, the spell would have been broken, and I could be your husband. But now I must go. In the morning, when she awoke, the palace inside the mountain was gone, for all she knew. She was asleep on a hillside, on the edge of the forest, and the rags that she had brought with her lay at her feet. She put on those rags, and she was determined. She was going to find him. East of the sun, west of the moon, he had said. This is where the troll that he was to marry, the troll who had cast a spell, lived in a palace. East of the sun, west of the moon. She traveled for many days, and she saw an old woman sitting by the edge of the road. She was playing with a small golden apple. And as she tossed the apple back and forth, the young woman said, maybe you've heard of a princess. He is to marry a troll woman who lives in a castle east of the sun, west of the moon. Can you tell me where to find this castle? <laughs> said the old woman. I have heard of you, and I've heard of this prince, too. <laughs> You're the one who's supposed to marry him. But east of the sun, west of the moon, I have never been. But my sister has traveled further. 
maybe she can help you. I will give you my horse. The horse knows the way. And here, take the golden apple. It might serve you some purpose. The young maiden climbed onto the horse and she rode off, clippity-clop, clippity-clop. When she found another old woman dropping a spindle with a, a little bit of yarn and gathering the yarn up, and the spindle was made of gold. I seek the prince who lives in the castle east of the sun, west of the moon, she said, as she climbed down off the horse. And as the first old woman had told her, she touched the horse behind the left ear, and the horse knew its way home. <laughs> so you are the princess who's supposed to marry him. I do not know this castle east of the sun, west of the moon, but maybe my eldest sister does. Here, you can take my horse, tap it behind the left ear, and it will find its way home. And off she went, clippity-clop, clippity-clop, with a golden spindle in hand. When she found the third sister, she had a golden spinning wheel. She climbed down off the horse and touched it behind, which ear was it? Uh, the left ear, yes. And clippity-clop, off went the horse. <laughs> I seek the palace east of the sun, west of the moon. Oh, <laughs> I've never been to such a palace, but the east wind, if anyone can carry you, it is the east wind. <sighs> and as the east wind blew, gentle and sweet, she asked the east wind, Hi, I have never traveled that far, but my brother, the west wind, he might know the way. Are you afraid to ride upon my back? She had traveled this far. She climbed onto the east wind, who blew to the west wind, and the west wind blew her to the south wind, and the south wind blew her to the north wind. The north wind was terrible and fierce. The north wind had been to the castle east of the sun, west of the moon, and said it will be a fearful and terribly cold ride. I blew an aspen leaf once, and I saw that castle. But I was so tired, I had to rest for three days before I could blow myself back. Climb on board, and I will carry you. And the north wind roared and howled. Storms rose up. Ships were tossed upon the waves as they crossed the North Sea to the land of ice and snow. And there, as the north wind dragged low, the young maiden's feet catching the crest of waves, he dropped her on the edge of the shore. He said, I need a few days to rest. But thank you, she said, for bringing me thus far. And she sat outside the castle, playing with a golden apple. Sitting in the window happened to be the troll princess with a long nose and raggedy hair. What is that golden apple you have? I wish to purchase it from you. It is not for sale, she said. Neither gold nor coin could buy it. Ah, it is not for sale. <laughs> Everything has its price. I will give you whatever you want. All I want is to spend a night with a human prince who I know to be enchanted here. If I can spend one night with him, I will give you the golden apple. <laughs> I can do that. Give me the golden apple first. She tossed the apple up to the window and the front door opened. She entered the great castle. She was taken to the bedchamber of the prince, her one true love. But he was asleep, so deep, so soundly he slept. No matter how she wailed and wept, she shook and cried. She could not awaken him. And when the sun rose, she was escorted from the chamber. She went back outside the troll princess window, and she began to play with the bob and the spindle, and it was made of gold, and it gleamed in the sunlight. And when the troll princess saw, she said, ha, ha, ha. What do you want for that? It is not for sale. Gold nor coin cannot purchase it. Ah, everyone has its price. Everything. I'll give you whatever you want. I wish to spend a second night with a prince enchanted within the castle. <laughs> I can do this. <laughs> and she tossed up the little spindle, 
made of gold, and the front door of the castle opened, and she was welcomed in. She was taken to the bedchamber, where for a second night the prince slept. She wailed and wept. She cried out. She shook him, but she could not wake him. When dawn broke, she was removed from the castle. The third day, she sat with a golden spinning wheel. And a third time, she asked and was granted her wish. But it seems that the servants, who were good Christian people, who had also been enchanted as slaves and servants to the troll princess, they had heard the wailing, they had heard the young woman cry, and they told the young prince. And it dawned on him that every night before he went to sleep, the troll princess had brought her a bowl of soup to share with him. And the soup must be some kind of potion. So on the third night, he prepared or pretended to slurp, but instead spilled it on the floor beneath the table. He pretended to sleep when the troll princess left. And when his one true love entered, he awoke. You have come just in time, for tomorrow we are to be wed. I have an idea. I'm not sure if it will work. Are you brave enough? She said, I have traveled thus far. I have, I have overcome such difficulties to be here, but yes, I will do whatever it takes. It sounds like a simple task, but those three drops of wax you dropped upon my shirt before we are wed, I'll ask the troll princess if she can wash them just to prove her mettle. And when she cannot, if you can, then you can be my bride. Washing clothes. She could do this and so much more. But if this is what she was asked to do, she would do it. And sure enough, the next day, as everyone was preparing for the grand wedding feast about to be held, he said to his stepmother, also a troll, I shall not marry her unless she can pass a few simple tests. The first might be the easiest. Someone dropped three drops of wax on this beautiful white shirt. This is the shirt I want to wear on my wedding day. Can she clean it for me? The troll princess took the shirt and ran off to a washing tub. But as she dunked the shirt into the warm water, the wax, it began to spread out into the fabric. No matter how hard she scrubbed, it would not get clean. Other trolls tried, and soon the shirt was as black as if it had been dragged through the ashes. When it was shown once more to the prince, he said, it was such a simple thing. Well, I'm sure this peasant girl sitting outside the castle, she could do it and toss the shirt her way. When the young maiden dunked the shirt in warm water, almost as soon as she touched it, the wax melted from the shirt. The shirt was white as snow, if not whiter. And because she had accomplished this magical task, the spell was broken. The troll princess, she was so angry that her head quite literally exploded. She exploded into a thousand little bits. Every troll exploded until soon it was just the prince and the young maiden who had traveled east of the sun and west of the moon to claim her one true love. Now all of the good Christian people who had been enchanted and enslaved by the trolls were set free. And riding the back of the north wind who had now rested, they rode back home far, far from the castle, east of the sun and west of the moon.